Uh, welcome back, Mike. Um, in our last talk, we were talking about um, super objectives and as a, a sort of through line in a play. And you had this wonderful, you said this wonderful thing about, it, it never occurred to me, it, a, a character has a super objective before the play starts. And unless they've died, presumably that carries on later. You know, there's a continuum and the play yeah. is just a little slice of life. That's right. That's just a, you know, we just meet them in a, a little part of their life, but they've had all this life beforehand. And they will continue, unless they've died, they will continue to have it afterwards. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so now we want to talk about something that is um, what you call a point of concentration. I would like, number one, I mean, I want you to talk about it in detail, but where did this idea come from? Well, and what, what, how does it relate to us as human beings in our ordinary lives? Oh, well, all right. Well, I have to tell you what it is first about relationship, because it totally is about the way we live. You see, I will repeat ad infinitum and ad nauseum that any good acting technique is human and part of our psychology and behavior and total, and that's when it's truthful. It's only when you get very contrived techniques which distort things that they become untrustworthy, you know. So there was a wonderful teacher, she worked with children mainly and in communities called Viola Spolin in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. And she wrote, a very, she wrote a couple of books. One is called Improvisations for the Theatre. And it was all based on trying to find spontaneity in freeing people. And it wasn't particularly for professional actors. But every time she would set up an exercise, she would say, OK, what are you trying to achieve? What's your action in this or objective in the scene? OK. And then she would say, and what is your point of concentration? What is the thing you've got to explore while pursuing this action? Mm. Do you see? So you had two things you had to do. There was something that you had to do active. And then there was something else that you were examining while you were doing it. For example, um, your action is to um, touch and use every prop that's on the stage while playing the scene. Okay? Okay, that's your action. And your point of concentration is to find a justification for doing that. You can't just go around touching things. You've got to justify as the character why you would pick up that phone, why you would move that cup, why you would sit in that chair. Do you see? Yeah. Uh, but in the space of 15 minutes, you've got to use everything that's on the stage or something like that, you see. So they know what they've got to do and, they, and they're trying to find, in this case, justify doing what they have to do. And that's the point of concentra concentration. And at some point I thought, oh, maybe one could connect that with the characters. The characters have objectives and things they're trying to do. But the the points of they must have points of concentration. Why are they trying to do what they want to do? Under what circumstances? And you see, <coughs> the uh, there's, a, there's a Stanislavski term which most actors know called given circumstances. So if I say to an actor, "What are your given circumstances?" He says, "Oh, it's uh, first act of the cherry orchard. It's the beginning of May." It's still very cold outside, it's warm inside, the cherry, cherry blossoms are in bloom. Um, yeah, uh, it's four o'clock in the morning, everybody's been up all night, three people have been on a very long, you know, three day train journey from Paris. Um, the, one of the characters is coming home for the first time in five years, so nobody's seen her in five years. Um, the estate is up for sale. It takes place in the nursery. Now, all those things are given circumstances, and there are masses more. They are the context in which the characters are pursuing their objectives. Right? Now, this, as far as I'm aware with most directors, actors, is never discussed or 
particularly or in a very vague generalized way and it sort of just happens or not I mean most of the time not I mean I've seen lots of productions of the cherry orchard you would never know this woman hasn't been at home for five years right because, because the characters I have not got connected that up that association or you do the first act of the three sisters which is arena's Saint's Day, it's her, what's it, her 19th birthday or something, 18th, I can't remember. And um, you see, I've seen endless, particularly in the past, endless <laughs> production of the of the Three Sisters, where everybody is very busy suffering because they're playing Chekhov. And there's not a clue that actually it's a very celebratory day and, there's, and it's the beginning of spring and there's a special lunch and there's a special dinner arranged and people are bringing presents because it's been ignored because everybody's busy being you know dealing in you know indulgently with the psychology and their feelings you see so the point of the exercise the point of concentration is to make sure that the actors are not just pursuing their objectives but pursuing it within specific contexts. You know, I mean, if I play a scene and it's freezing cold, it should be very difficult for me playing that same scene and it's very hot. The heat or the cold will have some sort of effect on me, you see. So um, it's a question of connecting those things to the objective. Now, maybe the best way to try to explain this is that when you're playing an objective, you're, you're, you're moving laterally, say from left to right, yes? You're moving through the play, okay? But you're not in a limbo. You're, you're moving through the play through dear, various situations, which will, must affect how you play your objective. They will impinge on what you do. So the technique, which has been a great freer for actors and myself as a director, is to apply points of concentration. So, for example, what I would say in the cherry orchard, okay, and it comes at the end of rehearsals when the actors know their text totally, they're, they're pretty well into their characters, they've got very nice relationships with the other actors, uh, they're playing their objectives truthfully, and their minds are free. They don't have to think about lines or anything else. And you say, okay, now everybody, we're going to play, we're going to run Act One of the Cherry Orchard. And I want you all to explore for yourself. Your point of concentration is exploring what four o'clock in the morning means to you in your character. And that's, don't worry about anything else. That's, it's going through the filter of four o'clock in the morning. Okay. After being up all night. Don't plan, don't anticipate, don't think, oh, I'll be tired and act tired. Just see what that does, because it isn't automatic that people feel tired at four o'clock in the morning. They may feel, you know, and the actors do it. And all sorts of things pop up. They laugh, they cry, they get irritable, you know, in different balances. Some people do fall asleep and wake up again. And you suddenly get all this color. And you say, okay, wonderful. Leave it alone. Great, well done. Let's do it again. This time, I want you to explore that it's the first, you're playing the act and your point of concentration on, this is the first time that uh, Lyubov Andreevna has come home after five years. She's the t titular head of the house, shall we say, but she's been very irresponsible. She's been living with a lover in Paris for five years. She ran away when her little boy was drowned in the lake. She left her 12-year-old daughter behind to be brought up by the house, you know, adopted daughter. And she's coming back. How do people feel about it? And of course, once the actors start to have a little think about it, they all have very different opinions. Some are joyful, some are curious, some are resentful, some wanted to apologize, you know, or who knows? I don't tell the actors what to think at all. And I don't suggest things to them. I think, think about it. And, and their choices and thoughts may change during the scene, how it's played. So on they come and they play act one again. 
And it is totally different from Act One when they were all tired. And then you do it as many times as you feel you can in one day, probably no more than three, you know, and you keep working. You say, okay, now Act Three, the estate is up for sale. This home you've all known and lived in all your lives and your parents and grandparents have lived in, even the servants, is up for to be auctioned because you're in debt. Play the scene again. Uh, act one. Act one. In yeah. act one. Yes, exactly the same one. And they do it again and it's totally different. Do it again. You're in the nursery. Point of concentration. What does it mean to you to be in the nursery? What's in the nursery? How do you feel about the nursery? Totally different. Okay. Um, point of the cherry orchard is in bloom. Now we know the cherry orchard doesn't produce fruit anymore. It was very fertile and fecund and productive many years ago. Now it's barren, but it still produces flowers and the blossoms in the spring. Everybody point of concentration on the cherry orchard. What does it mean to me? How do I feel about it? What totally different because you're adding and what you're doing psychologically is you're adding layer upon layer of the experience the inner experience of the characters and their relationship to their environment their past and so forth and so on okay and you don't say oh keep that that bit was wonderful keep that you just trust that they all the actors had some sort of experience doing those points of concentration some of them have been more vivid for individual people than others. It doesn't matter what's there is there, but something has happened because it's quite, it's quite a pressure technique to play my objective, absolutely truthfully, with a preoccupation. Well, you can imagine, let's say that you were feeling hungover or not very well today, and I was feeling bad tempered, and we were conducting this, you know, discussion interview. Um, and that was very strong inside us. You know, you're thinking, oh God, I can I keep, you know, I'm desperate for some water. And oh God, I wish I'd changed the timing and the date of this. And I'm thinking, calm down, Michael, don't be irritated, you know. It will have a very strong effect on how we deal with the situation. Yeah. Let's say, you were, let me give you an even cruder, simpler thing. Let's say you've been to, the, to a hospital and you've had an x-ray and they say, we'd like to see you again. We're a little worried. You'd go around with that preoccupation all day, wouldn't you, at some level? Mm -hmm. So it's, ex and this is what we're doing all day long in different ways. We're not just playing our, li uh, playing our lives laterally. We're living in an environment. It's hot, it's cold, it's Monday, it's Tuesday, it's, you know, it's spring, it's winter. We're, we're in lockdown. Um, I've got a new job coming up. I've just lost a job. You know, everything is affecting us because that's how we live through our lives, that we're dealing with all these things. They're in us at various degrees of consciousness and semi-consciousness and subconsciousness, you see. And this technique is making sure that the actors have actually explored it rather than the actor vaguely sort of lying in the bath and thinking, oh, I've been in Paris for five years, what's that like? And, you know, that actress might come up with something quite useful, but it won't have been worked into a body because playing an objective and, not, and having a point of concentration, which is often pulling you away from your objective, creates a sort of dynamic, I don't, I don't want to call it a tension in the wrong way, but a sort of tension that you've got to work through. It, it's quite hard and it's exciting. And what it does is that somehow it seems to release your imagination and it gets into the act of subconscious. Mm. Because you're wanting two things very seriously to really play your objective to you. And I'm so preoccupied with something else and the energy gets down into the gut and the actors produce things they have no idea are there. And they're really truthful. And so they are bringing all these thoughts up and then they're, and they're there sitting in layers. And then once they're inside you, some are stronger, some are weaker, some might vanish. You know, it's potluck, you have to sort of take a chance. I always think, well, 70% of it will work somehow. And then while they're inside you, they may be mixing up and cross-referring with each other. You know, 
the nursery and the cherry orchard and the estate might all mix up. I don't know. Now, the other technical thing that's working, and this is all about freeing the actor and giving them total creative freedom. As you've already seen, as I've described, you go through that act as many times as you can, either in one day with different points of concentration. And, you know, the, the actor is changing all the time. They're finding fresh things, they're spontaneous. Now, at the same time, their, their partners are having the same experience. So when I play something to you, you don't do anything like you've done before because you're being affected by your response to the point of concentration. So the actor is being refreshed both from within with the, their attitude to the point of concentration and what they're getting from their partners because of it. So the whole thing gets thrown up and it's sort of kaleidoscopic, that's all I can say. And it's the actors feel so free when they get used to do this, they have no fears on stage because what is happening, they're also starting to live, think like the character, not act thinking like the actor, pretending to think like the character. They are actually thinking like the character because if you've got a point of concentration, it takes up your whole brain, mind. You can't worry about your lines. And that's why you have to know the lines, because if there's anything distracting you, it won't work. You've got to commit yourself totally to being absorbed. Oh, the cherry orchard's in blossom. Oh, the cherry orchard, the cherry orchard. I know how you, you know. And so automatically there's a huge freshness and spontaneity that happens. And then because all these things are living inside the act, and because it's been quite a, an effortful, you know, emotion, emotion touching journey, triggering the, you know, hopefully the, the subconscious, the actors suddenly start to feel they have a real inner life. And, they, and whatever happens on stage, they'll know it. Now, you can also, now, there are two sorts of points of concentration. These are the internal, emotional, psychological ones, but you can also give the actors uh, technical ones, like, um, play the scene in the nursery and I want you to explore, well you might do this anyway with the other one, I want you to use all the props and the, and the furniture, everything that's in the room, I want you to make sure you, you investigate everything while playing the scene every tr truthfully and what happens, actors' inventions become so great that anything that comes to hand, they find they can justify doing things and and what's wonderful the set and the props come alive they look as though they're being inhabited that they are part and you know and then you can do it with the costumes you can do it for speed okay uh, i want you to uh, that run the whole act but you're getting a little bit sort of indulgent with the objectives and so forth so uh, the point of concentration is to see if you how much you can move the scene forward without rushing so then you can type you know it, it, it is a wonderful wonderful technical exercise uh, and it comes at the end of rehearsal and it frees things up. Mike, I wanted to, when you gave the example of you and me, you know, you were irritable for whatever reason, I was hung over or I've been told I've got some problem. Um, those are individual points of concentration. All the examples you've given, I want to ask you two questions that I want you to um, respond to. All the examples you've given are collective. So I want you to respond to that and whether you give individual actors points yes. of concentration. Start with, I Let me ask you the second question first, then you can answer both. And now I've forgotten the second question. <laughs> the second question, all right, just answer the first question, I'll come. <laughs> what I do to start with, I give every, I choose, a point of concentration which will affect everybody who is in the act, whether it's a tiny role or major roles. So everybody's relating to the same thing. Then I can start breaking it down and I can give different points of concentration to different characters with stuff which only affects them. If there's a relationship going on between a couple of people which nobody else knows, then do you see what I'm you know, so then you can, and then you can break it down to individual ones as well. Mm. But, but, and, and, and you only work on the scenes where that's applicable or whatever it is, do you mm. see? So that, that, that's very much. 
close. Now, but I, I, this wasn't my second question, but I want to ask you something else. I mean, you know, quite often our point of concentration might be on something comparatively trivial. You know, um, the fact that our trousers don't feel good on our... You take the information from the play. You do not invent points of concentration that are outside the script. Because then, God knows, you could just wander all over the place. And, no, you take the information that, that Ibsen or Shakespeare or Chekhov or Pinter, whoever, has given you. Okay. And That's so you are being true to the play. Yeah. All right. The second question I wanted to ask you is you have used uh, Chekhov as an example uh, where this is really productive. And, you know, you've created for us, uh, you know, in our imaginations that you, people have got a set, there are props, there are this, there are that, there are costumes, blah, blah, blah. You do a production with shared experience with five actors and nothing. And it's not Chekhov and it's not um, a 19th century, you know, uh, uh, play, it's a Shakespeare. Give us some examples of where you might have it's used. It's the same. It's the same principle. What is the where are the characters? Is there a time of day which is implied in it? Um, what what is the backstory? Where are they going? You know. Yes, you can do it. Of course. Um, obviously, with plays by Ibsen, should we say, and Chekhov, particularly Ibsen, there's a huge amount of backstory, and it's a wonderful way of the past being brought very much into the actors reality. So with Shakespeare, let's say, oh, the first, well, not, not the, let's say, forget about the rampart scene, you know, so let's say the first court scene. Okay, the point of concentration is on the, um, you could say on the death of Hamlet, pair, or, and then you can do it, it's also about the wedding of uh, Claudius and Gertrude. And everybody would know about that. Everybody would. And then he might say, and Laertes is going abroad. The court would know about that. Do you see? So you look on the information that's there. Okay, it's a court. Um, he doesn't qualify it. And if it's a small cast, um, it never, it nevertheless is that all the people who are there are there for a slightly um, formal uh, gathering. Do you see? So do you see? So you work through the play that way. Yeah. You know, if you're doing Winter's Tale, how many years have passed by between acts, the first half and the second half? Um, well, eight. Well, Perdita's grown up, hasn't she? So that's what twenty years, years or something. Yeah. yeah. You know. So that it's twenty years since. Something. So you use whatever information the playwright has given you, which are given circumstances. You see, and you don't invent, you know, because I've seen productions or heard of productions say when it's up, that Ophelia is pregnant. Well, there's nothing, nothing in the text that would indicate that. So, you know, so you're imposing something on the play which really isn't actable because it's not within the world of the play that Shakespeare's written. There are limits, you know. I mean, that's the trouble with conceptual interpretation. It sort of just thinks you can put anything on anything, you know, and then of course the play loses its fiber and its substance and its point. But you asked early on about how does this relate to life? Now the much deeper point of this, we grow up and all the time we are going through different circumstances. Our given circumstances keep moving and shifting with babies and then we're little, you know, tots and then we go to, you know, pre preschool and, you know, nursery school and then, you know, and so forth. And then we're getting deeper education and then we're going to high school and then we're going to college. And then, and all the way through, we're having different experiences with our parents, with our family, with people we're meeting, with the things we're learning about, our sexuality, you know. And they're all having an effect on how our character is developing. And they're in us. And therefore, we are developing ways of behaving quite unconsciously, I'm sure, most of the time, you know, which we feel is appropriate for us. So when I'm with my parents, I behave in a certain way, which I don't do with mates at school. 
which I don't do with girlfriends or boyfriends or partners or with my teachers or, you know, we, we sort of shift to adjust to what we think is the right way to behave. And so our language changes or uh, uh, the reference of our conversation, the, the degree of familiarity, the, the likelihood of touching, they vary. And this is a way of giving, getting the actors to have a tremendously varied, varied characterization, which is rich in detail. Because most time when actors characterize, you know, they give you a block. Oh, he's got to walk like this, and he does that, and he's got this gesture he always does. And it's very limited because the, we change. How often have you seen a play where the actors slightly change when they're talking to different people? Very rarely unless it's very obvious, you see. And we're shifting the whole time, you know. So, you know, Luba von Drevna, how does she talk to the servants? How does she talk to her own daughter? How does she talk to her brother? How does she talk to the park? You know, the, mm -hmm. the, the, and those things are being built in. And the lovely thing you can do with the actors, which they just adore, you do all these points of concentration. Then one day you say, okay, this needs a lot of time actually. Um, today, um, the point of concentration is going to be, let's say we're going to do Hamlet. Okay, the point of concentration is on Hamlet and everybody, and we're going to run the whole play in which Hamlet appears, the scenes, and everybody's point of concentration is on Hamlet, how they feel about him, what they think about him. Fantastic. And it's like a gift for the actors, you know, everywhere they look, people are thinking about move and they're getting so much. Then you say, okay, tomorrow we're just going to think about Claudius. So all Claudius has seen is point of concentration. And you work through the entire cast list. We're doing Gertrude, we're doing Ophelia, we're doing Polonius, we're doing Laertes, you know. Mm. And you do the little roles, you know, Gildenstern and Rosencrantz, and, you know, and you... And therefore, then, when anybody's on stage, even if they don't have direct contact with some of the characters, they always have a relationship to them. Yeah. And so when they're looking at them or listening in a scene, they're actually living and they're contributing to the reality and richness and texture of a scene. So for me, it's, it's, it's a glorious exercise. And it, what one is trying to do is recreate life in, 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 in little, mm -hmm. you, know, mm -hmm. you know, within the context of a play and the time you've got to work on it. But we're actually creating a living thing with all the association. Mm -hmm. So... And then if because, of, because of that, or I, I, I didn't block people or tell them what to do. But if, if I used to, once you use this exercise, you don't need to tell anybody where to go because they will go there spontaneously depending on what's happened. And they know the room they're in, they know the time of day, they have relationships with everybody. So they start to behave more and more truthfully. I was going to say naturally, but I don't mean it's all realistic. It could be very heightened. You know, you could do points of concentration to, to find the, the heightening level of, of performance. Yeah, and when I did this adaptation of uh, Hansel of Dust by Evelyn Wall, we had an extra week before we went on tour. We, we, you've, you've talked about that in great I detail. Talked about, I haven't talked about points of concentration on it because, and we sort of, I, well, if I have, I'm, it, you can always cut this out. Um, they, we, I, I, we run the whole show, uh, the half the play or, or whole play with them concentrated on their appearance, how they appear to other people to make sure they present themselves in a way that can't be criticized or judged or seen through. You know, then you do it for the language. Do, do the text as fast as you can and make it absolutely clear. So it's a technical exercise, but you're doing it with the truth of playing the situation. And of course, everything becomes crisper and sharper and, you know, and that extra week was one of the reasons that show really defined itself because technically it was so precise mm -hmm. with the freedom of acting, you know. So, okay, so that's points of concentration and it's uh, terrific. <laughs> Great. All right, Mike, good. All right, well then um, we'll bring this one to a close and I look forward to talking to you again. Me and you. Thank you for watching. Um, and I hope you enjoyed that, uh, that chat. And if you did, would you press the like button and also 
um, the, the subscribe button, that would be great. And if you wanted to be given alerts to when the next one is happening, just press the bell button. Um, if you want to put any comments or any questions underneath here, underneath the video, please do. And at some point I will um, re-interview Mike, as it were, and put some of these questions to him. So um, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.